If the judges think they've closed the file on the ice cream wars, they're wrong. For six years, we have been uncovering the full extent of a conviction that disgraces Scottish justice. And now at last, we can reveal it. It began one winter's evening, 14 years ago, in the bleak outer suburbs of Glasgow. A teenager called Andrew Doyle, fat boy Doyle to friends and enemies alike, was in charge of the ice cream van, a mobile shop selling groceries around the streets of Garthamlock. Doyle drove the van while a schoolgirl served the customers. It could be a dangerous occupation. There was a war on. Boy Doyle survived this battle of Glasgow's ice cream wars only to lose the war itself. In Easter week 1984, he was murdered. So were five other members of the Doyle family who died after someone set fire to the flat in which they lived. It was a crime with consequences that were to spread beyond the tragedy itself. For we believe that those responsible have never been brought to justice and that two men innocent of it have already spent more than a decade behind bars. Now we can tell the full story of a crime that shocked Scotland and of a conviction which, to the despair of many who believe in the superior quality of Scots justice, was upheld this week. The council estates of Glasgow, or the schemes as they're known in Scotland, were built with the best of intentions. An escape from the squalor of Victorian slum tenements. A chance to breathe fresh air, a place to bring up children free from disease, poverty, crime and corruption. That was the intention. These are the schemes. There are few amenities here. Few shops flourish, there's not much money around, and the premises are vulnerable to vandalism. So the travelling vans provide a necessary service. There's money in a van round. Back in the 80s, where this story begins, a good round could net you £200 clear profit a week. That's if you could keep your patch to yourself. Rivals were not welcome. Competition was discouraged. So when Agnes Lafferty took her van into the Garthamlock scheme, she knew the established vans would treat her as a trespasser. Well, on the first day there was, there was five competition vans brought into the area. Um, eventually, I think after about a week, there was a third van brought in permanently and his job was to follow me and whenever I stopped for him to stop, to take as much business away from me as possible. Sometimes the tactics took a more sinister turn. Smashing windows, eh, like letting, letting tires down. Eh, and the odd hole on the side, that, you know what I mean? Just, it was going to cost them enough money to get back on the road again, if they could get back on the road again. But it seemed to lose most of the most interest. They wouldn't, they wouldn't come back in the scheme again. It cost them too much. I didn't realise there was a threat until such times as uh, my ice cream van had been... Three men or four men had stopped in a car in front of it, jumped out and smashed the windscreen with baseball bats or picture handles, I don't know which it was. But the shotgun attack on Fat Boy Doyle's van represented a significant and terrifying turn for the worse. We're standing at the living room window and I looked out the, out, out the window and there was a machete ice cream van parked up 
next to that white car up there. Just where that white car yeah. is? Yeah, and a brown, beige coloured big car drove up beside the ice cream van. And somebody came out of the passenger seat with, with something, in, something like fire on him. And we out in front of the van and shot at the window. And seven weeks after the shotgun attack against Fatboy Doyle's van, the violence reached a terrible climax. It was in the small hours of Monday, April the 16th, the week before Easter. Andrew Doyle lived with his family in his parents' three-bedroom flat in Bankhen Street. It was on the top floor. The flat was unusually crowded that night. Six people died in the fire, one of them a child of 18 months. There was like a banging, like a loud banging, and then just heard there was a glass smashing. It must have been the fire. The heat breaking the glass, and then we heard the screaming, the shouting, shouting for help. There was a boy actually, he ran right up the stairs and tried to get in, but he couldn't get in. The flames were too, they were too fierce. And the guy was beaten back right away. There was no way he could get in. He had to get himself killed if he didn't even near it. Uh, and the black smoke itself, because when uh, a couple of the family were brought out to the ambulance, some of them were only in their shorts, and their whole bodies were pure black with smoke. Glasgow's a tough city, it's seen a lot, but there was shock at the wanton ferocity of this attack on an innocent family. A team of 50 police officers was seconded to the Ice Cream Wars murders. Over the weeks, they'd interview some 1,500 people, take 4,000 statements. Bank End Street, the scene of the fire, overlooks Balini Prison, one of Scotland's toughest jails. Hardened criminals, or NEDs as they're known north of the border, know that even behind bars they have one negotiable asset, information. Barlini's Sea Hall is an unofficial clearinghouse for criminal gossip. And there was one prisoner who seemed to have a lot to say about the Doyle family fire. You know why we're here, don't you? William Love was in prison on suspicion for an armed robbery. He told the police he'd been part of a campaign against Doyle. He said he'd been paid by a relative of a local hard man who also ran a van, Thomas Campbell, known locally as TC. And more critically, Love told them he had information about the fire in which the Doyle family died, the first real lead the police had in the case. Love said he'd overheard a conversation in a local bar, the Netherfield. Three weeks before the fire, Love said there'd been talk of setting fire to the door of the flat where Doyle lived to give him a fright. Among the plotters, TC, Thomas Campbell, that name again. Love had a string of convictions for serious crimes and was facing a long sentence on the armed robbery charge. After helping the police, and unusually given the gravity of the charge he was facing, Love walked free after objections to his bail were suddenly dropped. The authorities said they'd freed him for his own protection. The underworld assumed a deal. Love had grasped up a couple of other Neds in a deal for freedom. And so does one of Glasgow's leading criminal lawyers. No doubt whatsoever about that. Uh, he lied, and he made a deal with the prosecution. When the High Court refused bail to someone who's charged with armed robbery on the basis that he's too dangerous to inflict upon the public, and all of a sudden the prosecuting authorities who were opposing his bail withdraw that opposition, that's a deal. It has to be a deal. There's no other word for it. Whatever the motive for his cooperation, the villain love story was backed up by a man the police pulled in, Joseph Granger. He, too, had a criminal record. According to the police, Granger volunteered the information that he, too, overheard the plot, cased Bank End Street the same night 
and a week later was with Campbell on the night of the fire. Campbell, he said, had waited with another man by a wall while he'd gone off with a criminal called Joseph Steele. Granger's job was to keep edgy, look out, at the bottom of the stairs, while Steele and another man went upstairs to the flat to douse the door with petrol. Strange for a man voluntarily to admit his part in a multiple killing. Stranger still that the prosecuting authorities let him walk free, just as they had released their original informant, William Love. The police, meanwhile, went for the men their informants had fingered, Thomas Campbell and Joseph Steele. Campbell was in bed when the police arrived. That morning, Tommy was actually he arrested. Uh, well, me and Tommy was lying in my bed. As I say, I'm no uh, much a sleeper. And all I can remember is, like, say, doors getting banged, like car doors. And uh, the house was sort of a different situated for this. And they just, well, Tommy actually woke Tommy up and Tommy went down and opened the door. Uh, and then they came in and they were just ransacking everything. Uh, the Hoover bag, pulling at that. And I only had Stephen at the time. He was only about two, two and a half. The way he was screaming, he was hysterical. I was screaming as well, and they were nearly really let us out the living room. It was when they arrested him, according to the police, that Campbell volunteered an incriminating comment about the shooting and the fire, a remark which was to become the heart of the evidence against him at his trial. I only wanted the Van Wendy show up. The fire that fat boy was only meant to be a frightener, which went too far. Yeah, that's nonsense. Tommy never says anything like that. Tommy, in fact, didn't say much at all. I think it was mere try to calm uh, Stephen down and calm me down because I was hysterical. And, you know, just try to sit me down and sort of comfort me. But Tommy says very, very little. No, that's nonsense. The raid furnished more tangible evidence against Campbell. A damning piece of paper. On one side, a join-the-dots game they claimed Campbell and his wife had been playing, signed with his and his wife's initials. On the other side, a photocopied map of the neighbourhood with Bank End Street, the site of the fatal firebombing, circled in blue. Campbell, as you say, was no stranger to the police. Uh, again, he was somebody who would know perfectly well the police would be interested in him. Weeks and months had passed, he'd every opportunity to get rid of every scrap of evidence, and yet I remember the police went to his uh, house and they find a street map of the area with, uh, in fact, X marking the spot of uh, Bank End Street. Very careless, very careless. No, I couldn't believe that when I heard that in court. I just couldn't believe that. Uh, as I say, I was too busy a person, you know, with the wean, and I was pregnant as well, and uh, going to my work at night, preparing dinners, running to schools. I just didn't have the time to sit and play games with my man. I mean, I just didn't. I didn't have time to play games with my wean. Joseph Steele, like Campbell, was also in bed when the police came to arrest him. And just as Campbell had supposedly been overheard talking about the firebombing in a pub, so Steele, according to an underworld informant, had been similarly indiscreet in another pub. Indeed, compared with Campbell's, the case against Steele was uncannily symmetrical. For according to the official version of events, on his way to the police station, Steele, like Campbell, helpfully incriminated himself. He apparently blurted out eight words which would provide the basis for his subsequent conviction for murder. I'm not the one that lit the match. An implicit admission that he too was at the fire. There were four police officers in the car with Steele when he made this remark. Yet according to the police, it was the officer at the wheel who actually noted it down, which must have been rather inconvenient for all concerned because he had to stop the car to do so. At Steele's trial, the defence had a simple analysis of this unusual manoeuvre. Joseph Steele simply hadn't made the remark. The police had simply made it up. But all the officers maintained that they had heard the remark. 
Indeed, when they came to write it down, their records show that they recollected identically the very dialect, grammar, idiom and usage. I'm not the one that lit the match. 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 That lit the match. Now that was either a remarkable piece of crass stupidity on the, on the part of a, an experienced man like Steele uh, or uh, it's something that makes you raise your eyebrows and just wonder. And at the time I thought it was uh, interesting, shall we say, that with policemen surrounding him on all sides, the one man who's able to write it down uh, and preserve it posterity is the driver of the car. Uh, there was a bit of a smell around. The Ice Cream Wars trial started at Glasgow High Court in the autumn of 1984. The trial did not run smoothly. Central to the case was the evidence of the self-confessed lookout for the fire bombers, Joseph Granger. But at trial, this star eyewitness denied everything. Granger said the police had made up the whole story for him. He hadn't been party to the plot in the pub. He hadn't gone that night to reconnoitre the scene of the murder. You did not tell police officers any of these things, is that right? No. But you told me you remembered signing a statement saying these things. Aye. You knew when you were signing the statements it had all these things in it, is that right? Aye. But you signed the statement not because you told the police these things, but because of what? Pressure and their bullying. Aye. Do you want the ladies and gentlemen to believe that according to everything I've put to you, it was invented by police officers? I swear my mother's life had a to do with that fire. It was plain that there was something seriously wrong with the case uh, because the prosecution then uh, jumped from what was to be the, uh, called the Granger account of the case in which uh, Mr Campbell, for example, was meant to be standing over the fire while it was being set. They jumped from that to another account which was, well, Mr. Campbell was probably sitting at his home and having organised it. And they jumped uh, to that position on the basis of the evidence of uh, William Love. Can I ask you this? So Love was now the centrepiece of the prosecution case, with his story of hearing Campbell and Steele plotting the lethal attack in the pub. And central to that story was the date the plot was hatched, a date Love indicated when he gave evidence at the trial. Can I ask you this, Mr. Love? In March of this year, were you present in the Netherfield bar when there was a conversation about Fat Boy or Andrew Doyle? Yes, sir. Can you remember which day of the week it was? I would say it was the weekend, oh, sir, or near the weekend. What do you mean by that in terms of days? Friday, Saturday. If Friday and Saturday were the 23rd and 24th of March, could it have been either of those dates or one or other of them? Could have been, sir. Yes. The judge accepted that the case stood or fell on Love, who was either telling the truth or had managed to hoodwink the entire system of Scots justice. Uh, there is insufficient evidence to convict unless you accept the evidence of Love. Now, if he is untruthful, if this is a, a concocted story, then it follows, doesn't it, that he has played a gigantic confidence trick on the police, senior police officers, the procurator fiscal, and indeed the Crown authorities, because they accepted his story, allowed him out on bail, and have proffered him as a witness before you. The jury were out for almost two days. When they returned, it was to find Campbell and Steele both guilty. They were sentenced to life imprisonment. At the end of the trial, uh, I came out and I remember speaking to my junior about it. And I think our reaction at the time was, how the hell did that happen? Because we really couldn't see where the evidence was that ought to have convinced the jury. I get the feeling that if the divine had been sitting in the dock or on the side of the defence, it wouldn't have made any difference in that trial. In the halls of Scottish justice, there was mild concern about a conviction which depended so heavily on the word of criminal informants. 
But that's as nothing to the avalanche of anxiety that was to follow. As trial and error has discovered, Campbell and Steele were convicted on evidence which, by the law's own logic, simply could not be true. And the system which convicted Campbell and Steele had held in its own files for 12 long years the evidence which could have freed them. I said to the judge, I said, I've sentenced me to life for a crime I've never done. And he just looked at us. But deep down, I was wanting to scream. Uh, I said, this can't be happening. This isn't right. Nobody, nobody wins here. There's no winners. There's no victors here. There's the, the Doyle family are dead. Uh, the innocent are locked in prison. Their families have suffered. The Doyle family's families have suffered. And the public have been robbed of justice. Thomas Campbell grew up in a tough neighbourhood. He was the toughest of them all. A lot of people were frightened, frightened of his reputation because he was scared for anybody. And if you come up against him, you knew you'd come off worse. Well, he was the best fighter. He could fight anybody uh, in a square go. That's without a weapon. He, could, he was good at fighting or with a weapon. He was excellent. He had to come up against him and last long anyway. When you say he was excellent with a weapon, explain. And he was good at fighting. The hardly ever end, he got, got the better of him in a battle. Opposite gangs, when they seen him, they would usually run. If he was at the front of their gang, he usually was. First into the battle. And weapons were what? Nice hammers, axes. Axes? Uh-huh. Rarely, in trial and error's experience, do we get to hear directly from the victims of justice's mistakes. On this occasion, Campbell can speak for himself about those wild teenage years. You look back on it and you see it's absolute madness and lunacy because it was like cowboys and Indians with real weapons and people were being seriously injured and a lot of my friends were killed. Uh, and a lot of people that I was involved in were near to death. Uh, I was near to death on a few occasions myself. I, I was butchered uh, a couple of times myself. I've been hit with axes, uh, I've been bayoneted, I've been hit with swords, open razors, every conceivable weapon you can think of, meat cleavers. Uh, and it's absolute madness, it's over nothing, it's for no gain or no, nothing to it. It's just, just absolute madness. Campbell claims he settled down after he got married and had children. His ice cream van business suggests he wasn't a master criminal, but he says the police wouldn't believe that he'd changed his ways. They didn't want to believe it. Uh, to them, I was, uh, uh, as far as they were concerned, public enemy number, number one. In another age, we'd have said that Thomas Campbell was born to be hanged, or at least to have spent a great deal of his life behind prison walls for some crime or another. But the murder of six people isn't just any crime. To do justice to something that terrible, the right people should be convicted for it. And to do justice to itself, the judicial system should convict not on the basis of bad character, but of good evidence. So how good is love's evidence? The evidence where he swore to being in the Netherfield pub and hearing Campbell and Steele plot the attack. After all, when Granger collapsed as a witness, Billy Love became the core of the Crown's case. Love had told the police that he heard the conversation on the weekend of March the 23rd. But extraordinarily, another statement he'd already given the police meant that he couldn't have been in the pub at all. It happened like this. Love was in prison accused of an armed robbery when he told the police about the pub meeting. But this robbery, as it happens, had been committed the very same weekend, March the 23rd. Love, an experienced villain, had come up with an alibi for every minute of that weekend to make sure that the robbery couldn't be pinned on him. But that alibi account for the weekend of the robbery has not a word about any visit to the Netherfield pub. Nothing about seeing Campbell and Steele, let alone about 
hearing a conversation about firebombing the Doyle family flat. Yet, this is the same weekend as the one when he told the police that he did hear the men plotting the crime in that pub. Both accounts of the same weekend can't be true. One way or another, common sense suggests that the central witness in the trial of Campbell and Steele is a liar. Were you present in the Netherfield bar when there was a conversation about Fat Boy? But when Campbell and Steele's case first went to appeal, yes, though the court decided that Love's evidence was imprecise, it upheld the convictions. But perhaps they'd have thought differently had they known, as we have discovered, Billy Love's own involvement in the ice cream wars. Remember that shotgun attack on the ice cream van? A shooting witnessed by this woman who never gave evidence at court. Agnes, what do you know about who the man was with uh, the firearm? It was my brother, uh, William Love. Billy Love? Mm hmm How do you know it was him? Had he given you any indication that he might be doing that? Yeah, because he, he brought the, the gun into the house that evening. And I said, so what are you going to do with that, Billy? And he says, I'm going to give uh, Jimmy, I'm going to shoot Jimmy Mitchell's ice cream van just to frighten him, not to harm anybody, just to frighten him so he, he would move off this, off the scheme. Did he show you the gun? Yeah, it was, it was about that size, I saw, and it was sawed off at the end, a sawed off shotgun, it was about that, and he had it in a black bin liner. So he shows you the gun that night, mm -hmm. and then he leaves? Yeah. But does revealing love as a gunman make his evidence any less reliable? There are five ways to prove William Love is a deliberate liar. First, we found that on no fewer than three previous occasions, Love has been found guilty of perverting the course of justice. Reason number two. In the course of investigating this case, we had spoken to Billy Love when he was in Dartmoor. Even then, he had admitted lying. After his release, Love went to ground. Or rather, as we discovered, to water. We'd heard he'd been living on a houseboat on the Thames down in London. When we tracked him down, Love was alarmingly frank about his part in the shotgun attack. I was responsible for the shooting of the van, yeah. Why did he do that? Were you acting on instructions? No, I was not for Tommy Campbell, that's for sure, but I ain't stating who gave me the instructions, but I can state it wasn't from Tommy Campbell, yeah. But you went out in the Volvo? That's right. With the balaclava? Yeah. With the shotgun? Yeah. And your sister saw you? My sister saw me from the window. Reason three, Love is still admitting he lied at the trial of Campbell and Steele. Did you hear any conversation about any firebombing in the Netherfield pub on March 23rd? Never in my life, mate. I've never heard anybody discussing anything about fires in my life, mate. How about Burning in the people? Netherfield shortly after the weekend of April 7th? Never, mate. It was never discussed, man. In any other pub did you hear people discussing fires? It was fire fa fabricated information, mate. It was never said at all whatsoever. In any other pub never at any other any time? Any other pub, never in my life has it been said. Never. Mm. Where did it all come from, that story? You tell me, mate. But why should we believe a story told by a self-confessed liar? Reason four, the recollection of this man who was in prison with Love when he was suddenly released on bail. Frank Falloon said Love had told him at the time that the police had offered him a deal on the armed robbery charge. Yeah, that was about me. That if he would go along with what, what the police told him, then he, the charges against him on armed robbery would be dropped. I told him he was playing with fire and he was going to get burnt. But Billy's that man for listening. His first intention is freedom, regardless of the cost. As long as he's out the door, it doesn't matter. Consequences don't matter. He'd been through all the procedures he bail, refused in all conditions. One morning, a, a pal of mine came down for the top flat in our hall and told me that Billy Love was going out and bail. That only meant one thing, that he'd accepted the deal. We think William Love's deliberate perjury sent two innocent men to prison. Because there's a fifth reason why the system should have been suspicious about the integrity of Love. And the evidence was actually in the hands of the system itself. Love, as we've said, 
had already given conflicting accounts of the conspiracy plot on March the 23rd in the Netherfield pub. In one, he says he heard the plot to firebomb the Doyle. In another account he gives, he wasn't even there that weekend. One, at least, must be untrue. Now, trial and error can disclose the existence of yet another version Love gave the police. This time, he is at least in the pub, but the plot's being hatched on a completely different date. Not on March the 23rd, but sometime after the weekend of April the 7th and 8th. We know the account in this statement is a lie. We know it for the simple reason that on the weekend of April the 7th and 8th, William Love was behind bars, in jail. He couldn't have been in the Netherfield or any pub. Yet he'd sworn this statement in front of a sheriff, a cast-iron piece of perjury which could have been exposed as such by simply checking the prison record. This lying statement, which was in the files of the prosecution, was dynamite. It could have blown apart the whole case against Campbell and Steele. But it didn't because this potentially explosive piece of evidence simply wasn't disclosed to the defense. What do 12 lost years do to a man? The career criminal regards prison as an occupational hazard, the tax he pays on his trade. Both Campbell and Steele have done things they deserve to be punished for. Does it matter that this time they're paying dues, doing time for a crime they did not commit? Campbell has always protested his innocence. Refusing to eat prison food, he spent months on hunger strike and years in solitary confinement. Hey, when I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't eating, for instance, so, so there's no, there's no break up in the day, there's no breakfast time, there's no dinner time, there's no tea time, there's no supper time. So each day, each week, each month became the constant minute. Hey, there's, there's no, no difference from the night and the day. There's no difference from when you sleep and when you don't sleep. Hey, it's just the, 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 the perpetual minute uh, to live within that time uh, and no time passes uh, and no time is coming forward and no time is passing. It's just a uh, perpetually st standing still. Did you expect to die? Yeah, I expected to die. Did you want to die? Didn't want to die, but I expected to die. There were occasions where, where after 97 days without food, uh, they locked me in a cell and took away my tea bags. Because although I wasn't eating, I still had my own tea bags. I was drinking tea, black tea. Uh, so they took away the tea bags, took away my pens, my pencils, and my paper, so that I couldn't write. So after uh, 97 days without food, uh, they took away, and I was 10 days without fluids. Uh, at that point, death was would have been a blessing. Death would have been a blessing many, many of the occasions, because there's a lot of pain, uh, a lot of pain throughout the whole body, a lot of psychological pain. Over the years, Thomas Campbell has been no stranger to pain. Sixteen prison officers came into my cell, ring my cell, riot gear, battens, and just beat the living daylights out of me, handcuffed me behind my back, and jumped all over me, jumped my stomach, squeezed my testicles, kicked my ribs, just a torture session. Uh, the official version was that I'd fell from a wall in an attempt to escape, and then the second version was that I'd suffered from uh, appendicitis uh, and then finally they admitted what happened. I had to take that to civil court and I won that in civil court. So you won compensation for having been assaulted by the prison service in jail or agents of the prison service? Yes, and you also got compensation for uh, in an infestation with lice in what was uh, supposed to have been the hospital wing of Peterhead Prison and these were bird lice which were crawling all around the bedding and uh, they infested and infected his wounds. How did he manage to get the evidence out about that? He stuck the lice in sellotape and sent me a letter saying, can you do something about it? Joseph Steele did not campaign from inside the system. His protest against prison 
was repeatedly to escape from it. It was 24 hours a day. I was plotting and planning to protest. It didn't matter if I, if I had a problem outside with my mother, my family, my girlfriend or a being. Constantly, I was uh, trying to highlight my case. I think up other ways uh, to bring the public's attention. Steele escaped three times, making his protest by handcuffing and supergluing himself to various prominent landmarks such as Buckingham Palace. He then returned obediently to jail. At the end of the day, I think it was, it was about the best thing I've ever done because it, people started to take notice and say, well, here's a man, done me six murders, he's only run for prison, he's out four days and he's going to sell at the gates. So, but I always knew anyway for day one, if I were going in a position to escape, I would do it and I always knew that I'd highlight my case and come back. You were asking to be sent back to prison, weren't you? Aye, I was just, my, my cry was, I'm innocent, please, somebody listen, and somebody day someone will do it. The doubts about these convictions are not confined to the reliability of William Love. There should have been question marks, too, over the other central witness against Campbell and Steele, Joseph Granger. Granger was the man who had originally told the police he was with Campbell and Steele on the night in question as part of the firebombing squad. Granger has consistently complained that the police put him under pressure to come up with that statement. Complaints he made to his solicitor, Tony Marnes. I found that not unusual because the police tend to do that. They'll pull in as many local people as they could to try and squeeze to the pipsqueak. And if they don't get anything out of that, then who knows what they might do after that. I wasn't the least bit surprised when later on I found that when Joseph surfaced, he was supposed to have signed some confession. Of course you strike me down dead. Only in my family's life, that is the truth. I never even heard of the toils. Never, I certainly nothing whatsoever to do with it. I, do you know what I mean? It's, it's crazy, it's as if it's somebody else. Do you know what I mean? You know what's been going on all these years. You told the police that you were with Campbell and Steele at the Doyles, were you? I never told the police that. The police told me that. It's a big difference. And I suppose at one point, Joe broke. And um, I just remember one day he came home and it was late on and he told me. They ended up signing a statement that they had made because they threatened them that they would charge him with the Doyle murders and he would get 30 years. Granger's girlfriend always maintained that they spent the evening innocently together. When Granger eventually signed a statement saying he was involved in the fire, Lynn Chalmers felt under pressure to do the same. I didn't want to change my statement. Then when the police arrived, uh, they told me that I, if I never changed my statement, they were taking Joe away and he'd be charged with the Doyle murders and he would get 30 years in prison. And you changed your statement? They handed me a piece of paper with a statement written and told me to sign it. You signed something which you knew was untrue then? Mm-hmm. Because I thought they were going to take Joe away and it came 30 years because by this time I really was frightened because and I just knew, I, I don't mean I knew, but I was frightened because they were, they were able to take us away to police stations and when people were phoning up to find out if we were there, they were saying no. So they were allowed, they were getting away with saying no, that a certain person was not here, try another police station, not the time you were sitting there. You'd lost control of your life then? Yeah, they had control. They ended up having control of your life. I put it to you that you went to the flat Granger knew he'd be in even worse trouble if he withdrew the statement he said the police pressured him to sign. Well, if he withdrew his statement, then uh, he ran the danger of being charged himself. With what? With murder. The police would say, right, if we don't have your statement, we're going to charge you with murder. Yes. On what basis? On what evidence? On the basis of his alleged confession. Which he'd withdrawn? Yes, but that wouldn't matter. So there he was. If he withdrew his statement, he ran the risk of being charged with murder. So, so what did you advise him to do in court, then? Tell the truth. You'd have to tell the truth in court. But you signed the statement not because you told the police officers these things, but because of what? Pressure and their bullying. Yes. You want the ladies and gentlemen to believe that everything I've put to you has been made up by police. I swear in my mother's life, I know f all about that fire. 
So, at the trial, Granger, as we know, withdrew what he'd said to the police. But what had he actually said? His statements were never disclosed to the defence at Campbell and Steele's trial, but we've now had the chance to examine them. And they make explosive reading. Two words in particular are forensic dynamite. A week. He tells the police that he kept lookout for the fire bombers on the night of April the 15th, a week after the pub plot. So April the 9th would be the date the plot was hatched. But Love swore it happened in March, and it was on Love's evidence that the conviction depended. How could the Crown prosecute Campbell and Steele for murder with this contradiction at the heart of the evidence? And why wasn't this key contradiction disclosed to the defence? Historically, disclosure of evidence in Scotland has been a matter of discretion by the authorities. And this worries some legal experts. The problem with that is that experience has shown uh, that the judgment of what is relevant or not lies with the Crown Office itself and that therefore the defence can never be sure that the judgment of the Crown Office as to what should be made available to them or not is a sound judgment and one that benefits from the perspective of the defence. There's also the difficulty that even the Crown Office, even if it did operate a full system of disclosure, it itself uh, isn't confident that it will have all the material given to it from the police who will make a decision at ground level as to what to give or what not to give to Crown Office. So it's at the discretion of the police what they reveal to the prosecution and it's at the discretion of the prosecution what they reveal to the defence. Can that be in the interests of justice? It's very problematic. After he'd given evidence at Campbell and Steele's trial, Granger was arrested immediately. He was eventually convicted of perjury and sentenced to prison for five years on the basis that his original police statement had been the truth and he was lying when he went back on it in court, which presents the legal system with a bit of a conundrum. You see, the Crown Office in Edinburgh is a large and stately building. But even at the time, the offices of Scotland's top legal authorities were only within yards of each other. Yet in one office, they're prosecuting Joseph Granger for perjury on the grounds that he did hear the pub conversation about the firebombing one weekend in April. While in this office here, they're prosecuting Campbell and Steele for murder on the basis of William Love's evidence that the same pub conversation took place one weekend in March. Did no one notice this contradiction in the evidence that put two men away for 12 years? Did the Crown lawyers just not talk to each other? Well, it's, it's difficult to believe there was a lack of communication in Scotland as a village, really, in, in a criminal justice system, it's a small village. Uh, people do talk. So it may have been known at the highest level in the prosecuting authorities that Granger was being prosecuted on the basis of one date, Campbell and Steele were being prosecuted on the basis of another, both dates supposedly being true, but one of them clearly a lie. You're saying that that may have been known by someone in the Crown Office. If it wasn't a blinking well, should have been. Meanwhile, Joseph Granger and his girlfriend are the last casualties of the ice cream wars caught in the crossfire. Branded on one side as a grass for giving a statement that implicated Campbell and Steele, and on the other, branded a perjurer for withdrawing it in court. I'm angry at a system that you're brought up that you're told to respect and trust. Ruined our lives, and still to this day, we don't really have a life because we'll always have it hanging over our heads. I'm just bitter against the system, I suppose, and it shouldn't be. It's something people shouldn't have to have faced them inside them, but the system has made us the way we are today. Do you know what I mean? And it's, it's just cruel. People 
people shouldn't be allowed to get away with this. No. I'm either a liar, I'm either a beast, or an eye, or I'm a former. It's not, I can never get any swollen suitors, I can never get nothing. That's quite sad that you don't have respect for anything like that, because at the end of the day, we do need the police at the end of the day. Um, it may, it's just made me, I suppose, a hard person even towards people that I meet. I just, I just don't trust anybody. Perhaps the greatest scandal of this case is that while so much effort has been invested in punishing the innocent, so little has gone into identifying the guilty. Genuine leads which might have led to the murderers being identified do not seem to have been pursued. Trial and error's own researches might be of some help. Research which doesn't rely on the doubtful evidence of criminal informants, but on facts which we believe were inadequately investigated. First, on the night of the fire, the cashier at this nearby garage was approached by a young man asking if he could buy petrol in a can. She was suspicious and refused to serve him. Fact two, as the fire began, another witness saw a car here speeding away from the scene. It crashed. The driver and passengers abandoned it and fled. The witness got a good view of the occupants of the car. There was a strong smell of petrol and an empty petrol can on the back seat. Fact three, none of these suspicious people described by the witnesses bears the slightest resemblance to Thomas Campbell or to Joseph Steele. While we were working on this programme, the Secretary of State for Scotland referred the case of Campbell and Steele back to the courts. After 12 years in prison, the news came that they were immediately to be released. For more than a year of freedom, they waited for an appeal hearing most were confident they would win. That appeal was brought under new legislation which brought Scottish law into line with its English counterpart, allowing convictions to be reviewed when witnesses like William Love were retracting perjured testimony. I think it's a very significant case because it's an example of a, a case, a serious case, in which everything that could possibly go wrong has gone wrong from the point of investigation right through to the point of appeal. Um, if those uh, defects can be remedied, then I can't see that that would do any harm to the Scottish judicial process and the respect uh, which the public are entitled to have, have for that. This week, the case went back to appeal. In a judgment that to many in Scotland makes a mockery of the new legislation, the judges upheld the conviction. Thomas Campbell and Joseph Steele went back to prison. It wasn't that the three judges disbelieved what William Love and his sister were saying. Just that, for technical reasons, a majority of them decided they didn't even want to hear it. Well, I feel as if my country, I feel as if the law itself has been abused. Uh, everything. I feel that I've got no trust in any authority whatsoever. Call themselves an authority and I distrust them. As far as I'm concerned, these people see the truth as that whichever is most convenient at the time and have no conception of what the truth is and, and what that entails. I've given up on justice. OK, uh, I, I hope well, eventually I'll be freed and I'll clear my name. But the people say, uh, Oh, you've got a few quid and you'll do this and you'll be that. Money's nothing. You've done 12 and a half years. When I came in, my son was about two. He's 15 now, and I hardly know him. That hurts. It hurts a lot. <laughs>